Hi guys, this is Miss McHugh recording from home. We're trying out a new thing. It's called Flipped Classroom. And the way that works is rather than spending more time in school taking notes and listening to me talk to you all day, um, rather you take the notes at home and then we can do more um, fun interactive stuff in class. So we're going to learn a little bit about um, bacteria in this section and how we classify bacteria. And then in the next section, we're going to talk about viruses. All right? So, bacteria. The first thing we think about when we think of bacteria is bacteria, they're bad, they don't do anything good for us. Um, some pictures that you can see up here on the screen, uh, this is a staph infection. You've probably heard of that before. Um, this is the strep throat bacteria. You might be familiar with that if you've had strep throat before pretty nasty. So a lot of times when we think of bacteria, we only think of the negative things um, that they do. However, bacteria do a lot of good stuff too. Um, in this picture, we have, um, these are structures called nodules, and they are found on the roots of plants. We're going to talk more about these a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we also have a picture of some digestive bacteria, so we forget that sometimes there's bacteria living inside our digestive system. There's friendly bacteria, the ones that are supposed to be there. Um, then there's unfriendly bacteria too. But most of the bacteria found in your digestive system is in fact friendly. Lastly, it's a really, really close magnified picture of um, your skin and a hair growing out of your skin. As you can see, there's a lot of bacteria that live on your skin and they have a really important role there. So we've already talked about prokaryotes. We know that they don't contain a nucleus. Um, we're going to look at how prokaryotes are classified, because they actually fall underneath two categories. So a prokaryote is a unicellular organism that lacks a nucleus. All prokaryotes used to be classified in the kingdom Monera. So any sort of single-celled organism that didn't have a nucleus was classified under the kingdom Monera. However, now that we've done a little more research, we've split them into two categories, eubacteria and archaebacteria. Eubacteria is the larger of the two kingdoms. This is the more common prokaryote. They can be found everywhere. If you take a look at this picture, we have E. coli. Okay? Usually, eubacteria have cell walls that protect them from um, injury, and it can also help determine their shape. We're going to look at bacteria shape a little later. Um, the cell walls contain this carbohydrate called peptidic glycan. That's really important. Make sure you write that down. Um, some bacteria even have a second cell membrane that helps them be more damage resistant. So if you take a look at this picture of bacteria, okay, we see our cell wall. It's there in yellow. Um, the cell membrane, it's that double layered structure right there. If you take a look at the red outlining, that's that second membrane that they're talking about. That just provides more protection because remember, bacteria are single-celled organisms. They don't have this whole body made up of millions and millions of cells. It's just one cell living on its own. So it needs to have as much protection as it can get. You see we have the ribosomes here. And again, our DNA is not enclosed in a nucleus. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. Another thing you might notice is these weird structures called flagellum. Those help bacteria move. We're going to talk more about that later. The second type of bacteria, it's not as common. This is archaebacteria. You can see that PowerPoint is not a big fan of that word, but that is in fact how you spell it. They look like eubacteria, but they're very different. They don't have peptidoglycan in cell walls. Make sure you write down that archaebacteria don't have it. Big difference. They live in these really harsh environments like hot springs, underwater vents, and in animal intestine tracts. Um, but even though they're so weird, their DNA actually uh, is really, really close in structure to eukaryotes. So even though archaebacteria are weird, um, they actually are more closely related to eukaryotes, which are those really complex cells. So we might be more closely related to archaebacteria than we are eubacteria. That's kind of weird. So take a look at what we're looking at. This video is called Holy Cow, and it's going to tell you all about um, the bacteria that are living inside of the cow's intestine. Jersey cross. Um, I know. <laughs> so, the reason why she has this fistula in, it was put in in 2002, and it's 
so we can take rumen samples from her. So cows and other ruminants, such as sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, they have what's called a ruminant digestive tract, and it has four chambers to their stomach, the first of which is the rumen. And the rumen has all the bugs and bacteria, the good bugs, that are needed to digest the hay and other material that they eat, which we can't digest. So what happens is, is we get sick ruminants in our hospital who haven't been eating for a couple of days, and all of their bugs in their rumen die, and their digestive tract basically shuts down. So without all of those bugs, they can't digest any of their food. Uh, even, if they, even if they eat, it's not going to really get digested too well. So what we use Portia for, um, we take off the cover to her fistula. So normally it's covered and sealed nice and well. Um, we take that off and we can get rumen samples from her which have all the bugs that are necessary to keep the other sick animals digestive tracts going. So we reach in nice and deep here so you can get a good sample. Down towards the bottom is more fluid than the top. The top is more of the fibrous material because it floats. Um, so if you reach in and grab some, see all the juices coming out here. And we take this bucket and strainer here and we squeeze off all of the juices through the strainer and into the bucket. So normally you want to fill up about half a bucket or a bucket depending upon the animal that you're doing this with. The actual process is called a transphonation. We're taking the fauna from her stomach and putting it into another animal's stomach. So we take the juices that we get, which are in the bottom of this bucket, and we take this feeding tube here, and we go into the hospital, and we pass the feeding tube into the sick animal, along with the juices and maybe some alfalfa pellets to sort of jumpstart their digestive tract and give them all the bugs that have died in their stomach to get their digestive tract going again. Um, Portia has had this fistula in since 2002. It was done as a standing surgery, local anesthetic, some antibiotics, some pain medication. Um, the scar tissue forms around it. There's really no nerve endings in it or anything like that, so she doesn't feel the fistula in her. It doesn't make her sick. It's not going to change her life expectancy. It doesn't really need any maintenance. The only thing that we do is um, sort of clean off the stuff that seeps out the bottom. So, how cool is that? We Well, we had talked about how um, you know, you can reach inside the cow and get the bacteria out, and I told you about that a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of people were asking me, well, you know, what good is that? Why would you do that to a cow, other than just, you know, some sort of scientific research? What you should have gotten from the video is that when you have a cow who is, um, sick, and so their intestinal bacteria isn't working anymore, you can actually take the bacteria from a cannulated cow and put it into the sick cow. And then the sick cow um, can rebuild back up its bacteria in its stomach. And then it can break down food again. Um, so there's a lot of medical uses for some of the weird science we've been looking at. So, um, archaebacteria, that's the second type of bacteria. Remember the first one was eubacteria. Archaebacteria are the weird ones that live in strange environments, like the inside of a cow's stomach. Gross. But cool. Um, all right. So what we're going to focus on now is how we can classify bacteria. Looking at um, the shape of prokaryotes, um, there's three different shapes. There's bacilli, cocci, and spirilla. Uh, bacilli um, just means that it's rod shaped. So if you take a look at these pictures, you can see that the bacteria are sort of a cylinder shape. Um, whenever you see a picture of a bacteria in the book, it's usually a bacillus bacteria. It's just that long rod shape. Um, coxy, that's spherical, so you can see that they are kind of round. Coxy, the coxy shape is spherical. The last kind is spirilla. That is a bacteria that's corkscrew shaped, and we're, when we look at movement, we're going to see how those type of bacteria move. It's kind of weird, but pretty cool. But you can see that they're shaped like a spiral or a corkscrew. All right. The second way you can classify bacteria is by what their cell walls are made of. And we do this really cool thing called a gram stain. All right, so this is how a gram stain works. You're going to get to see the amazing artwork 
of Miss McHugh. Um, and so the first thing you do is you create a colony with both types of bacteria. So we've made a colony of um, a gram-positive bacteria and a colony of gram-negative bacteria. We'll talk about what those words mean in a minute. Now, when I'm doing these drawings, I'm really only showing you one bacteria at a time. Realistically, in your Petri dish, you'd have um, a lot of the bacteria, so you wouldn't just see one, you'd see many of them. So the first thing you want to do is get your um, bacteria growing on your Petri dish, and then we do a series of stains. All right, take a look at the PowerPoint. You might have noticed a little switcheroo just happened, um, because the first stain that we use is in fact the pink stain. I had them switched. Um, so the first thing we do is we stain our bacteria with this pink stain. And what it does is it stains the entire cell. Um, that way, when you um, at the end, when you look at your cells, whether or not they're gram positive or gram negative, you're going to be able to see them. So first there's a pink stain. The next step after the pink stain is a violet stain. What that does is it stains the cell walls. So it doesn't soak into the cell. What it does is it sticks to that peptidoglycan carbohydrate that's in the wall. And so now all of the cells would appeal purple. After the purple stain is added, then we douse our cells in ethyl alcohol. All right? So here's the trick. So when you add the alcohol, what it does um, is it washes away excess stain from outside of the cell. Now, in a gram-positive cell wall, um, the wall is really, really thick. You can see it's way thicker than the gram-negative wall. And so that wall actually absorbs some of the purple stain and hangs on to it. In a gram-negative cell, because the wall is so thin, um, it doesn't really hang on to the purple. And in fact, when you add the alcohol to the gram-negative cell, the alcohol actually washes away, it just totally dissolves the gram-negative cell membrane. So after you've added the alcohol, you take a look at your cells, and what you end up with is the gram-positive cells appear purple because their cell wall was thick and it was able to hold on to that violet dye. The gram-negative cells, however, their, cell, their uh, cell wall was dissolved by the alcohol because it was so thin and weak, um, but they've maintained that pink dye that we added initially. And so gram-positive cells appear purple, and gram-negative cells appear pink. So we've looked at how you can classify um, prokaryotes by their shape. We've looked at how you can classify prokaryotes by their cell walls and what their cell wall structure is like. Now we're going to look at how you can classify them by the way they move. This is um, really, really neat when you look at it under the microscope. And so I provide you with a couple of videos that are going to show you how that movement happens. So bacteria, not all of them can move, but a lot of them can. And the way that they move um, is they're able to sense when there's some sort of food or nutrient source so they can move toward that. Or if something toxic is added to their environment, they can sense that by different sensors that are found um, on the outside of their cell wall. And when they sense those toxic chemicals, they're able to move away. So they don't really have the brain like we do, and they don't have messages in a nervous system going from the brain to the rest of their body. Rather, they use chemical sensors on the outside of their body to power the different types of movement structures that they have. The first type of movement structure is a flagella. We've seen this in a lot of our pictures. It's a tail, and the way it works is it whips really, really fast, and it allows the bacteria to go somewhere really quickly. Um, and we're going to look at a video of what a flagella um, using bacteria looks like. So here's our bacteria um, with flagella, using them to move around. I'm not going to show you the whole video because you can get the basic idea from the first 30 seconds. So look. You can see the bacteria, they're flying around like crazy, making huge movements um, in one single flow. Now you can't really see their flagella, you can't see the little tail, um, but based on the movement you can tell that they're using this propeller-like part to push themselves through the water. So a flagella gives bacteria the ability to move really quickly um, in a specific direction. All right, so we just looked at how um, prokaryotes can move using a structure called a flagellum, that tail that sort of whips them back and forth. Another type of movement 
Um, that is, there's no actual body structure propelling the motion, but rather um, the prokaryon on its own is able to move in a certain way. So what we're going to see now is a, uh, an example of a spirillum. Remember, that is our prokaryot that is shaped like a corkscrew, and how they use their spiral shape to move forward. All right, so here it is. This is rotospirillum. That's the container that they have it in. Look at that movement. It's spinning itself like a corkscrew. Imagine a corkscrew going into the cork of a bottle. It's spinning, and it's using that spinning motion to move. Awesome. The last type of movement that prokaryotes can use is moving along a slime-like material that they create. Now, if you can imagine, this movement is kind of like that of a snail. So they have this slime that they can slide across. Not necessarily one they're leaving behind, but one that they're laying down that allows them to move. Um, so here's that gliding motility that we were talking about. So if you look over on the left-hand side, you can see this um, <clears throat> sorry, this bacillus bacteria slowly sliding itself across the screen on its own path of slime. So we've looked at the three different ways um, that prokaryotes, our bacteria, are able to move themselves. Um, next we're going to talk about metabolic diversity. Now we've heard these terms before. You can divide um, and classify different organisms based on how they get their food and how they get their energy. So we've talked about heterotrophs before. Remember, they get energy from other organisms. And we've talked about autotrophs before. They make their own food from inorganic material. So this is where it gets a little tricky, and I don't want the terms to make you feel nervous. I just want to introduce them to you because you might come across these. All I want you to do for this slide is write down the vocab words in your notebook and we can talk about them in a little more detail when we come across them in class. The terms on this slide might be a little more familiar to you. We've talked about photoautotrophs a little bit because those are organisms that make their own energy using the sun and then chemoautotrophs are those bacteria that we found deep at the bottom of the ocean. But again, I just want you to take the vocab down here and we can talk about them when we come across them in class. Just like we did with the heterotroph and autotroph slides, I'm just providing you with a little bit more vocab background so that when you see these terms, um, you can recognize them later. Um, so just take a minute to write down um, this vocabulary and the definitions next to it. Finally, there are three different ways that bacteria can grow and reproduce. All three ways are totally cool. The first one is called binary fission. So, what does binary fission look like? Here we have our bacteria, again, a bacillus, usually how you're going to see them drawn in the book. And we see the cell wall on the outside and then the DNA just floating freely inside. So the first thing the cell has to do is grow to be twice its size and replicate its DNA. So you can see that the cell has grown to be huge and now there's two sets of identical DNA inside the cell. Once the cell gets to a big enough size and it's replicated all of its DNA, it then starts to divide. You can see that these fissures are forming. That's where we get the name binary fission. So the fissures get deeper and deeper on each side until eventually the cell is split into two, identical daughter cells. That's binary fission. Okay, the next type of reproduction is called conjugation. So I've drawn conjugation out for you. We have bacteria 1, and we're going to um, present bacteria 1's DNA in the color purple. And then we have bacteria 2, whose DNA is going to be represented by the color green. And you can see that this tube has literally formed between them. So what that does is it allows some of the DNA from bacteria 1 to move over to bacteria 2. And at the same time, some of the, bac the DNA from bacteria 2 is moving over to bacteria 1. What eventually happens is that you end up with this mixture of DNA. You can't really see it, but now it's green and purple. And then over here we have purple and green DNA. Basically, it's a lot like how a mom and a dad of, you know, the same species will mate, and the result is an offspring with a mix of the two individual organisms' DNA. So rather than creating two clones, like we see in binary fission, 
conjugation allows DNA to sort of be swapped so that genes can be shared among individuals. The last type of reproduction that bacteria can undergo is called spore formation. Now this happens a lot of the time when the bacteria is exposed to something really stressful in its environment. So to look at spore formation, we're going to follow Mr. Endospore, and we're going to look at how Mr. Endospore resolves um, some environmental conflicts. So here's Mr. Endospore. He's a happy little bacteria living in the soil right underneath your feet. If you take a close look at Mr. Endospore, we know that he's a prokaryote because his DNA is floating freely inside of him. He doesn't have a nucleus. Remember that. So he lives in the soil, and it's a very happy place to live because in the soil there's lots of water to maintain all of his um, cell functions. There's all kinds of nutrients in the soil because um, the other bacteria in the soil are producing all kinds of good things that are going to help him live. He's a pretty happy guy. So Mr. Endospore, living under the soil, minding his own business, is totally ignorant to what's going on above the soil. You can see that it's the end of fall, the trees are losing all of their leaves, and unfortunately, winter time is rolling in. Okay, So we have snow falling down, we have freezing temperatures, and all of a sudden, the environment starts to change. So, Mr. Endospore, who's used to living in this happy little environment under the soil, is starting to notice that it's getting a little cold, and the water around him is starting to turn to ice, so there's no more water available, and all of a sudden, it's getting a little bit too cold for him to perform his normal self. Luckily, there's a reason we call him Mr. Endospore. So when conditions are unfavorable, they're actually able to start enclosing their DNA and some of the cytoplasm into a thick internal wall. This isn't a full functioning cell that's being created inside Mr. Endospore. It's just what we call a spore. So when Mr. Endospore can no longer live in the conditions that are around him because it's too cold and there aren't enough nutrients, there's the spore existing, waiting, dormant in the soil until the conditions are right again. So the following spring, that spore can grow and develop, when the time is right, into a new bacteria, who we're going to call Endospore Junior. So, there you have it. The three ways that bacteria can grow and reproduce. Binary fission, conjugation, and spore formation. Take a minute, if you need to, to pause the PowerPoint and take notes. Here, we have some pictures of the different types of growth and reproduction, probably a little more realistic than the drawings I gave you. We have binary fission, conjugation, and spore formation. So, why are we learning about bacteria? Well, the thing is, bacteria are really, really important to the environment and to us. So, for one, bacteria are the major decomposer on Earth. So decomposers break down dead organic material and put it back into the ground for future organisms to use. So if you take a look at the picture, we have a rotting log, something you've probably come across in the woods before. Um, but what you probably didn't realize about this rotting log is that there's millions of bacteria inside the log breaking down all of the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, all of those important elements and putting them back into the soil for plants to use in the future. Another way that bacteria are helping out the soil is by doing what we call nitrogen fixation. So here's the deal. 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is made of nitrogen, and all living things need nitrogen to make up our DNA, our genetic material, remember those are our nucleic acids, and um, our amino acids, which remember those make up our proteins. If you don't remember what amino acids and DNA look like, this might be a good time to pull out those cards from your notebook and remind yourself of what those structures are. If you take a look, you'll notice that they both contain nitrogen. The problem is that atmospheric nitrogen isn't usable by plants or by animals. So how do plants get their nitrogen? Well, there's bacteria that live in the soil, and they've actually learned to coexist with the plants by living in these nodules, these structures that we can find on the roots of a lot of plants. And what they do is they live inside these nodules and they take in the nitrogen from the atmosphere and they fix it. 
They turn it into nitrates and ammonia and other nitrogen containing products that the plants can actually use. Then, when we eat the plants, we get the nitrogen, then the nitrogen can move through the food chain that way. So the bacteria are really, really important for us to um, build up those really important macromolecules that we talked about earlier this year. Lastly, humans, we take so much advantage of bacteria. So there's a lot of different jobs that bacteria can do that we can't necessarily do. Remember that big oil spill a couple years ago that was in the news? Well, one way that people are able to deal with oil spills is by adding these special bacteria that actually eat petroleum. And so they'll add them to the water and the bacteria will eat up all the oil. So instead of having to clean off the oil um, with all of these different labor intensive strategies, we can just add bacteria to the water, they can eat up the oil, and then the byproduct of them doing this is just carbon dioxide, so it would just go into the atmosphere. Really not that big of a deal compared to all of the other labor and time that has to go into doing it other ways. Also, uh, we use bacteria to remove toxins from water down in our waste treatment plants. Um, all that gray water, everything that goes down your drain, that goes to a wastewater treatment plant. They then add bacteria to that water to clean it up so that it's safe enough to go back into the main waterways. We use bacteria to make medications. There's this really cool thing that a lot of soil bacteria can do. They can make their own antibiotics. So when there's competition between different species of bacteria in the soil, um, some bacteria release antibiotics, which kills all the bacteria around them so that there's more nutrients for them. We've learned to harvest these antibiotics and put them into medications that can help get rid of bacteria in our bodies that aren't supposed to be there. Lastly, we need bacteria to digest food. We've kind of talked about this already, and you saw it um, in Portia, that cow we looked at earlier. But remember, we need bacteria to digest a lot of the foods that we eat. Otherwise, we wouldn't really be able to eat them. So here's your task. As you've been going along, you should have been taking notes on the right-hand side of your interactive notebook. If you haven't been, you're going to have to go back and take notes. On the left side, this is your challenge. I need you to design a bacteria. So I want you to think about a bacteria that could live in a certain environment. So first pick an environment. Then design a bacteria that would live perfectly there. So what type of bacteria is it? Is it a eubacteria or an archaebacteria? So is your environment pretty normal? Or is it extreme, like at the bottom of the ocean or in the mouth of a volcano? So where does it live? What shape is it? Is it a bacillus? Is it spirillum? Go back to that slide. Does it move? And if so, how does it move? What sort of locomotion techniques that we talked about could it use? How does it get its food? Is it a autoheterotroph? Is it a chemoautotroph? Go back to those slides and check it out. How does it reproduce? Lastly. Is it a good bug or a bad bug? How does it influence humans? Is it something that might make us sick or is it something that might help us out? So once you've picked an environment, design your bacteria, think about what sort of characteristics it has, and then be sure to draw a picture. Tomorrow in class, I'm going to check to make sure that you've taken all of your notes and that you've done the left side activity. Then we're going to start doing research for this bacteria and virus wanted poster that we're going to be working on for the next couple of days. So, see you tomorrow.